Now, our first plenary is uh, Secular and Religious Perspectives on Basic Income. Session will be, please, will be chaired by uh, Dr. Stuart White. Stuart is a philosopher uh, at the Oxford. May I request Stuart to please come onto the stage. Dr. Malcolm Torrey. Malcolm Torrey is also a philosopher, but volunteers as the general manager uh, at the Basic Income Earth Network. And uh, Hassanain Jaffa. Hassanain uh, combines many roles in his life, one of them being a th he's a theologian, Islam Islamic theologian. Louis Haag, who is the chair of Basic Income Earth Network, has not been able to make it because of health reasons. Robert Van Der Wien, one of the founders of uh, um, BN itself, I'm really happy that despite many difficulties, he has been able to make it, and he's amidst us. And Dr. Carl Weiderquist, Carl is also a philosopher. It's fantastic to see an assembly of so many philosophers here. Okay, now I hand it over to Stuart to take it forward. I'd like to start by uh, welcoming you all to this uh, first session on secular and religious perspectives on basic income. Um, thanks very much to Surat and the other organizers uh, of this Congress. I was here yesterday for India Day and it was a really terrific uh, day of discussion. I learned an incredible amount and uh, uh, it was really quite inspiring to, to hear more about what's been happening in India. Why support basic income? Why, why think that basic income is a desirable idea. A lot of people, when they're asked to explain, to give an answer to that question, will appeal to some kind of ethical, philosophical, perhaps religious perspective. Even those who think of themselves as having a very pragmatic support for basic income, grounded in a response to very pressing real-world problems, when you when you in, in interrogate that, that pragmatism, you often find that there are, there are particular values uh, uh, of a philosophical and ethical or religious nature which underpin that pragmatic support for basic income. And one of the things that's, I think, very striking about basic income and the basic income movement, if we can talk of a, of a, a, a basic income movement, is the the diversity of philosophical and religious perspectives, the diversity of ethical and religious perspectives uh, from which basic income derives its support. And that's obviously a strength of the basic income movement, that, that diversity of perspective, that, that gives us a sense that basic income can become a, a common common ground uh, across diverse ethical, political, and religious perspectives. But that diversity is also perhaps a challenge. Um, if you think, for example, of uh, the, the way in which basic income draws, draws support both from left and right politically. That on, one, on the one hand, that's a strength. It means there's a potential for alliances uh, across left and right. Um, but it's also a challenge. Um, certainly in my experience, uh, some people on the left are wary of basic income precisely because there seem to be uh, also people on the right who support it. And I think a, a, an issue there to, to reflect on if you're a basic income supporter. And also, as I think we'll focus on in this panel in particular, um, it, it may be challenging that there are both secular and religious perspectives that give support to basic income. There's a, uh, a view which says that uh, religious perspectives shouldn't have a kind of central place in the politics of a, of a democracy because religious arguments, perhaps uh, particularly sectarian, they can only appeal to their, the adherence of the religion, they have less public purchase than other, supposedly less public purchase than other uh, secular philosophies. Um, so there's, there's a challenge there in thinking about uh, the way in which so-called secular uh, on the one hand and religious arguments uh, 
uh, and perspectives hang together as part of a basic income movement. And I think it, certainly in the academic discussion of basic income, which I'm familiar with, um, we've tended perhaps not to explore the religious perspective. So one of the things which I think the panel is trying to do today is to try and correct that imbalance and try and bring the religious perspectives in and think about uh, the, both the, the pros and cons of that. Um, before I turn to our panelists, just to say that although there is a sort of diversity of perspectives that support basic income, I think another question uh, we need to think about in, in this panel is whether we have enough diversity of, of perspectives on basic income. Are there perspectives that we lack, that we need? I think already this morning, uh, uh, in one sense, we've had uh, an enriching of our perspective uh, by listening to some testimony uh, from people who've actually received a basic income. That's certainly a new experience for me at a basic income conference. So the diversity of perspectives, secular and religious, a strength and a challenge, that's what we're going to talk about in this panel. And uh, I'll just do a quick, a further round of introductions. Uh, myself, I'm a tutor in politics at the University of Oxford. I've written on basic income uh, 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 in an academic and a lesser extent an activist context. Uh, we also hopefully by video have Louise Haag, uh, Professor of Politics at the Department of York, um, long-standing advocate of basic income and author of a new book, The Case for Universal Basic Income, uh, which came out this year. Secondly, we, uh, we have Hassanain Jafar, who's Managing Director of Eyes Collective in London and also Director of Basic Income UK. Uh, Hassanen is, is also uh, has a background in community organising uh, with Citizens UK. Our other uh, panellists include Malcolm Torrey, uh, very long-standing advocate of basic income in the UK, uh, with a, a long-term uh, role in relation to the Citizens Income Trust in the UK, and the author of a number of books on basic income, including Money for Everyone, why we need a citizen's income, and citizen's basic income, a Christian social policy. Carl Widerquist uh, is one of, the, I think, the founder members of uh, uh, the US basic income group, US Big, um, uh, has a doctorate in economics and in political philosophy, uh, and his uh, doctoral work in political philosophy was published as a book, Independence, Propertyless, Propertylessness and Basic Income, Freedom as the Power to Say No. Robert Van Der Veen uh, is uh, formerly a professor of politics with a specialism in political theory at the University of Amsterdam. Robert has authored a number of excellent articles on basic income, including one of the sort of founding articles in the philosophical literature co-authored with Philippe Van Parijs, um, A Capitalist Road to Communism. And also, uh, possibly joining us, uh, um, uh, Faisan Mustafa, uh, who is a professor and vice principal of the uh, university we're currently at, the Naslar University of Law, uh, who hopefully will be joining us as a discussant. So, to start the uh, panel off, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to say something about their own ethical perspective, where where they're coming from uh, in terms of support for basic income. Each of them will have uh, roughly six to eight minutes to say that. Hopefully we'll be able to bring in Louise as well through video link. Um, uh, I'll then ask a few questions, perhaps particularly exploring this question about the, the role of religious and secular arguments respectively in the basic income movement and basic income advocacy, and then I'll open questions out to, to the floor. And uh, Roberto Merrill uh, uh, from the University of Mino is also going to serve uh, as a discussant uh, uh, on this. I gather. Okay, so Malcolm, do you want to kick us off and say something about your perspective on basic income? Thank you to Sarath for this session, this innovative session at the uh, BN Congress. I come from, I'm Malcolm Torrey and I'm director of the Citizens Basic Income Trust in the UK and I come to this subject from a 
wide variety of perspectives. I'll come to that briefly in a moment. But what I've been asked to speak about today is the Christian perspective from which I come to the subject of basic income. A basic income, or a citizen's basic income, as we sometimes call it in the UK, is an unconditional, automatic, and non-withdrawable payment to each individual as a right of citizenship. Uh, it, that's, it's as simple as that. At the heart of the Christian faith is the grace of God, by which we mean the non-withdrawable love and unconditional generosity. You can see the connection. We do not earn God's love. It is simply a gift. That is at the heart of the Christian faith. And it is no surprise, therefore, that a, number of, a large number of Christians have been involved in the basic income debate over the years, particularly true of the Quaker tradition within the Christian faith. And you find Quakers represented in many of the initiatives uh, in the UK in particular in, in the basic income history. Jesus said in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 21, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. What he meant by that was that the institutions of this world and of our religious, and of our religious traditions are for the benefit of humankind. It is simply a gift. The Sabbath was a gift to the Jews. It wasn't simply an obligation. Sometimes obligations, sometimes gifts become obligations, but they remain gifts. A basic income is a gift in that sense. It's simply given to us for our benefit. So for a Christian, the primary reason for pursuing the basic income debate has to be that it reflects the heart of the Christian faith, the unconditionality at the heart of the Christian gospel finds an echo in the unconditionality at the heart of basic income. The Christian tradition finds absolutely no echo in conditional benefits, whether they're means tested or for certain categories of people, it is very hard to find a connection between the Christian faith and those. But that isn't the end of the story. Because a gift can inspire a gift in response. Thus, Jesus' words in Matthew's Gospel offer an invitation. You received without payment, give without payment. And so, the receipt of a basic income is not an invitation to do nothing in the world. The receipt of a basic income empowers people to make a difference in their communities, in their workplaces, in their families. It is an invitation that results in action. And that is how the Christian faith works too. It is an unconditional gift, the love of God, and that is an invitation to us to give unconditionally. A little while ago, I was asked if I would write a book that would introduce the subject of basic income to the Christian churches. And so I wrote Citizens Basic Income, A Christian Social Policy. Remarkably, it's still on the publishers, um, Darth and Longman and Todd's website at five pounds. So if you want a copy, um, then then, then do go and look for it to, before they decide that that's too cheap. Um, what I'm going to do briefly is to read the list of chapter headings in the book, because whilst I have given to you the main reason why Christians might support basic income and why a basic income can be supported within the Christian tradition, there are many other facets of that tradition which chime with a basic income. So here are the chapter titles of the, of the book. Citizens' basic income would celebrate God-given abundance. Cele Citizens' basic income would be an act of grace, that is, unconditional love. Citizens' basic income would recognize our individuality. It would recognize God's equal treatment of us. It would provide for the poor. It would not judge. It would constantly forgive. It would ensure that workers would be paid for their work. It would be the basis of a covenant, that is, 
a covenant is not a contract. A covenant gives first and then expects a response. Citizens' basic income would inspire us to be co-creators. It would understand both our original righteousness and our original corruption. It would recognize our mutual dependency. It would facilitate a more just society. It would promote liberty. It would both relativize and enhance the family. It would facilitate the duty to serve. It would be welcoming and hospitable. Those are the chapter titles. There would be similar things to be said in relation to other world faiths. And I hope to hear something from Islam later in this session. The significant differences between the different faiths mean that a member of one faith ought not to say how members of other faiths would relate to basic income. So there is much further debate to be had on that issue. All I can say is that over many years, I have very much valued working with people of many different faiths and of seeking with them to change the society in which we live. That kind of cooperation between different faiths in the basic income movement would be most welcome. Having said all of that, I've been asked from what perspectives I come to the basic income debate. There are, in fact, many of them. I have now told you just one. But there are a wide variety of ethical theories that have meaning for me. First of all, utilitarianism, for which consequences matter. I experienced at first hand many years ago when I administered means-tested benefits in the UK for two years, the consequences of basic income. The consequences of a basic income would be, uh, of means-tested benefits, the consequences of basic income would be far preferable to the consequences of the UK's means-tested benefits. So anybody coming to this issue from a utilitarian point of view will find much to think about. John Rawls, with his original position, with the person in it not knowing what position they will have in society, that means a great deal to me. We would want a level of financial security in the society in which we emerged when we were born. We would want the ability to earn our way out of poverty if we were in it. A basic income provides those. I have very much valued Immanuel Kant's emphasis on the universalizability as, as a requirement for moral law. A basic income is by definition universal. We don't even need to think about universalizing it. It is simply moral in Immanuel Kant's sense. The religious tradition that's given us unconditionality at its heart, the Christian faith, has a secular version, and it's the gift relationship that we find in Richard Titmus's book, The Gift Relationship. That's an ethical position regardless of any religious connections. It means a great deal to me. Human beings are incommensurable. And if you've read any Emmanuel Levinas, you will understand that. We are not categorizable. The only response in the benefit system to that has to be a basic income. It is all of these philosophical and ethical positions that mean a great deal to me. And I have come to basic income from all of them. But I have come also from my own Christian faith, from the tradition which I have come to value. And so I would commend to you the book and that we all continue to ponder on the relationship between faith traditions and basic income. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, we'll turn next to uh, Hassanane Jafar. So over to you, Hassanane. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Good morning. I'm Hassanain Jaffa. Um, I was amused today to be introduced as a, theo a theologian by, uh, uh, by Sarath. I think to, to classify me as a theolo theologian, you'd have to expand the definition to practically breaking point. If anything, I've done a bit of reading around theology. I am not a theologian. In fact, when Sarath called me and asked me uh, to come and speak here, um, on the Islamic perspective, I said it might be difficult to get 1.6 billion opinions on the stage. Um, what I will do uh, is talk from the perspective of a Muslim, um, and a Muslim particularly in a minority context, 
uh, which is all that's represented here. I, I, I haven't seen any Muslim majority country representation here. So that, that's the perspective from which I come. But my personal story is a bit different, actually. My, my personal approach to basic income wasn't from um, the Islamic perspective, but my faith and my upbringing in the Islamic culture is what has led me to be an activist of any sort in the first place anywhere. So my, uh, my work with Citizens UK, which I did o over a number of years, was as a result of my membership of my faith institution, which is a mosque in Birmingham, and that is eventually what led me to, um, to the campaign on basic income. There is a very strong Islamic culture around giving, around wider society, um, and around contributing to the society. So my experience at Citizens UK in my faith community and in business actually is what led me to the campaign around basic income. But there is a very strong Islamic case to be made for the campaign on basic income. And there isn't much work done on it, unfortunately. I have read uh, a couple of very good papers. Um, but like all religions, I imagine, but my familiarity with Islam is best, there is a huge emphasis in the Quran and in the, in the Hadith, which are the narrations from the Prophet, um, on the emphasis on meeting the needs of all in society. And in fact, there's quite um, strong, almost forceful language across the, the text where um, people who do work towards meeting the needs of others in society is considered highly virtuous, is really praised, and those who are seen as greedy, and actually there's a lot uh, in the Quran that points towards merchants who are seen as usurpers and who are greedy. Um, not all merchants, but I mean, often there's that distinction made. Um, and the condemnation of that greed and, you know, verses like um, that we will make hellfire easy for you because you've made the world easy for yourself, you know, and things like that. So really strong language around this. So there is an, an overall, an Islamic perspective that requires more work, certainly, and I'm not a theologian. I'm not here to build that theological perspective, but there's certainly a big argument there to be made for basic income. There is also one huge pitfall for any argument that anybody will construct around basic income from the Islamic perspective, which is that the prophet was a political leader, and he ran a government in Medina, and he didn't implement the basic income, the unconditional basic income as we see it today in his lifetime. And for anybody trying to create an argument in the Islamic world, that is gonna be the biggest challenge uh, that they face from a theoretical perspective. But actually, my interest is more about talking about this from a Muslim perspective rather than an Islamic perspective. And by that I mean, um, where, as an activist and not an academic, when we're looking to promote basic income in faith communities, it doesn't become about the rational or theological arguments around it. It becomes about why adherents adhere or why people practice their faith and what we can do to tap into that and make this part of their practice. And from that perspective, actually, especially in the UK, which I know best, um, the Muslim community is prime for tapping into. The Muslim community, uh, on the one hand, in all minority contexts in the West, has major issues which basic income would seek to resolve. So in the UK, for example, in Birmingham, where I live, we have a 20% Muslim population. 75% of those Muslims live in poverty. And this problem is prevalent across the UK, and I'm sure it's prevalent in most minority contexts where Muslims are. So there are plenty of issues like that which uh, basic income for the Muslim communities would be of huge benefit. So that's one of the primary motivators, I think. Um, but the Muslim communities are also uniquely charitable. In the UK, a recent study found that of all the different faith groups in the UK, the Muslim community was the most charitable. So on the one hand, living in poverty, on the other hand, the most charitable because there is a very strong culture of giving, of contributing in the, uh, well, in Muslim communities, in the minority world, certainly, and I think in the Islamic world in general. 
And lastly, again, an area which I think needs a lot of work, but the Muslim communities in minority contexts everywhere are heavily affected by Islamophobia and racism. And even in areas where they're not, there is a perception of victimization because of what's happening globally in the world. And the, uh, I know there's some work coming out of America, I learned yesterday about some of that, but there is um, a lot of reason to believe that a basic income would seek to resolve uh, or, or be part of the resolution of this problem as well and actually have a big impact on the experience of Muslim minority communities uh, in the UK and in the West generally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was, uh, we go to our next uh, speaker. Thank you. I, uh, I uh, have a very much a secular perspective on basic income, but I would like to talk today about how my secular perspective relates to the uh, religious perspectives that uh, have been have been so formative in the societies which we live in and my upbringing specifically. I have been trying to work out a theory of justice that I call justice is the pursuit of accord for the last 15 years and I've gotten quite a ways through it. I have one book out on it uh, called uh, uh, called A Theory of Freedom is the Power to Say No, Independence, Populousness, and Basic Income. And this idea of the power to say no uh, is not just, to me, it's not just a handy catchphrase, but it's something exceedingly important that most of the way we tend to support income in the traditional welfare state is short-sighted. It is that we start out with the idea that the poor are immediately suspect. Anybody in need is immediately suspect and must be judged and separate the sheep from the goats. And the good poor who prove themselves worthy will be helped and those bad poor will be, will be left alone. And by doing this, we're creating a principle. And the principle is that those who are privileged are capable of judging those who are less privileged. And by do this, we think we are saving tax money for the middle class, that we only have to help these good poor. Uh, but actually what we're doing is putting the entire middle class, the working class, the poor, uh, everyone except for the very wealthy, in the position where they can be judged by the very wealthy and must prove themselves worthy. And we all need, as opposed to this, to stop judging and start helping and to say that the first thing we do is, is, is realize we are incapable of judging the, those less privileged than us. And we must realize that to put everyone on equal footing, we have to give everyone the power to say, give or grant or recognize or stop interfering with the power that everyone has to stay out of participation, active participation in our economy, which we all would have if we have enough access to the resources of the earth. We are, into, we are creating poverty by separating individuals from access to the resources of the earth. And by this, we are making all of us, the middle class, the working class, however you want to define it, the, the able, the disabled, everyone at the mercy of a very judgmental system. And one of the, now, this perspective, this perspective is something that is highly controversial and that I, I think many in the basic income movement are sympathetic to. And it remains a hard sell in in the wider world, but it is it is it is taking it is taking on, and it, it's it's uh, uh, a, as a challenge. But I'd say that this is something that actually I think grows out of my Christian upbringing. Uh, I I was raised by liberal Christians. I'm not a Christian myself today. I was raised by a very religious but very liberal parents, and the the 
liberal and even socialist side of, of Christianity has never died in America. It's been outshouted by religious conservatives. But it's, it is still there. It has been there for a very long time. And the kind of upbringing that I had in looking at the New Testament was given to me a, really a, a, a sort of a philosophical anarchist view of the state, which is a philosophical anarchism is not necessarily the position that there must be no state, but that the state must be viewed skeptically, that just because the state or the government or the majority says do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And very often, the state needs to be challenged. You get that perspective I got that perspective from the New Testament by the, by the fact that the, the Roman Empire was very hostile to the early Christians and the stress of the morality of the Bible was do the right thing regardless of what the Roman Empire is telling you to do. But when you look at charity, um, I think there is that charity is one of the most stressed things throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. But it is not often connected to this idea of the covenant that everyone is equal and that grace is a gift from God that Malcolm talked about, and this should be done unconditionally. So the Jewish and the Christian branches of the Abrahamic faiths do not specifically say give and give unconditionally. Uh, now, the, as I understand it, the other two Abrahamic faiths uh, both actually have verses that say this or something that says this a little more literally. Um, and uh, my perspective on, uh, on, on this comes from, from uh, several sources. One, in 2006, at this conference in 2006 in Cape Town, South Africa, a Muslim woman came and talked about the idea of zakat. And zakat is one of the five pillars of Islam, and it's often uh, translated as charity. But she says that it's actually more than charity, that it is a, that it is, um, it is a responsibility. Charity is often portrayed in Judaism and Christianity as a good thing to do but not necessarily is a fundamental responsibility. It's not one of the Ten Commandments. But it is one of the five pillars of Islam. And what she said is it, there's a responsibility to eliminate poverty in the community through this zakat system. And another paper which came out recently, which is called uh, Islamic Perspectives on Basic Income uh, by Abdullah al-Shami and Catherine Bullock, make this connection with basic income and even say that Something similar to it did exist in the first Islamic society established by uh, the Prophet Muhammad. And there are some ideas that this should be done, that, that giving, to a, a giving to those less in need should be done unconditionally. And there's even a verse, there's even a verse in the fourth Islamic faith, uh, sorry, the fourth Abrahamic faith, uh, which is uh, Mormonism, which is... Uh, Christianity plus a New Testament, and well, Christianity is Judaism is, uh, plus a, a New Testament, so I'd say Mormonism is a, a fourth Abrahamic faith. And in Mormonism, there's a, I, I, came across, I came across a verse in the Book of Mormon that says, always give to a beggar because you are a beggar before God, uh, which I think is actually a very beautiful verse, and I'd actually heard somewhere that actually most of the best stuff in the Quran is just lifted from the King James Bible, and I, I went asking uh, people who know more about Christianity than I do, is this, do you know this verse, is this in the Bible, is this, where is it from, is this taken from the Bible, and it's not in the Bible, not literally in those terms, however, it is in the Confessions of St. Augustine, that very line, which comes up in the Book of Mormon, is in the Confessions of St. Augustine, who makes that connection that we're all beggars before God with this idea of grace, this idea that you don't earn grace, God gives you grace, and you're never worthy of it. Well, if you are, then you shouldn't be judging those who are less privileged than you, and you should give and give unconditionally. Um, and I think that all of these different perspectives 
need to be taken into account and listened to because we all come from these different perspectives and we can all learn from each other. Um, and learning from the secular perspectives and the religious perspectives and the different ones is very important. I think, uh, and one way to say why it is so important, uh, so it said to me in something I heard that Salman Rushdie said, when she said that once you stop arguing about whether these stories are true or not, then you can realize what good stories these are and what deep morals there are in these stories and how much we can learn by studying these scriptures. So I think we all need to listen to each other and take these different perspectives into account. So there's my, uh, my disjointed perspective of uh, religious and secular takes on basic income. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, let's now see uh, if we can go to Louise's video. Thank you. Hello, my name is Louise Haag. I'm making uh, this presentation from York. Um, I'm delighted to be able to present um, today. I'm, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about um, my perspective on universal basic income. Uh, and I'm going to do that by talking a little bit about my book, which has just come out with uh, policy called uh, The Case for Universal Basic Income. Um, and in that book, I make um, what I refer to as a democratic humanist case for basic income. And I do that by trying to also clarify uh, how it's possible to have common ground uh, in terms of the institutional innovation that basic income represents, but also to have different uh, normative perspectives, uh, which then also, I think, lead to uh, different outcomes when it comes to governance. So, really, the book looks at basic income and the case of basic income in the context of development governance. And my argument is that basic income contributes in that context to a form of what I call humanist governance and humanist justice. And one of the uh, underlying rationale uh, that I present, which I think is different from perhaps some other arguments, is that I think justice should speak on people's behalf. Uh, and what that really means, I think, in terms of the, the case of universal basic income, uh, is that I emphasize the institutional properties as distinct from the redistributive properties of basic income, by which um, I mean not only that uh, basic income helps, helps build people's agency by providing economic security, but actually that basic income contributes to generating a new governance structure and to legitimize and make visible the importance of governance structures to support individuals' agency and to erect institutions of justice um, as opposed to leaving it to individuals, so to speak, to bargain it out themselves. Uh, and so making this argument, I think, does uh, somewhat change the focus of what it is that basic income achieves and does in a political context. Uh, and I also think what it does is that it um, allows us to look at basic income as, as a long-term project uh, we, we, of institution building, which is necessary but not sufficient for this thing that I call uh, humanist justice. So in this context, I make some more specific arguments. I talk about the challenges that we face in terms of development governance today. Um, and I see those challenges very much as a case of uprooting of development governance. And so that implies, of course, a critical perspective on globalization. It also implies a critique of what I consider to be sometimes rather fatalistic perspectives on this uprooting of development governance that has occurred. Now, some people say that um, really there isn't an uprooting, there's a sort of re-regulation stage for being powerful. And I, yes, I agree with that to some extent, but I actually think this has, that argument has somewhat been superseded by the fact that states uh, have lost uh, really the powers and the means to set the agenda uh, for institution building. And for me, that is really a problem uh, because whatever you think of the state, the state is the legal entity that sets down uh, the rules and regulations and the norms uh, by which justice, including humanist justice, uh, is made possible. And so we do need to reclaim uh, 
from my perspective, the regulatory power of the state, but we also need to shape and democratize it. So the second argument uh, in that context is then um, in terms of exploring, as I said before, the institutional properties of basic income and what that entails. And for me, it entails, of course, a certain vision of basic income, uh, which is that it's not really essentially there to alleviate poverty, it's not really essentially there to reduce inequality. Um, we need other instruments to do that. Um, rather, it's there to erect uh, um, an inst a different institutional architecture, a foundation. Um, and this uh, takes me uh, to, the, to the question of governance. Um, so I think that uh, something that interests me greatly is how um, basic income contributes to promote what I call coherent governance, in particular health coherent governance. So now we're looking at uh, the problem of human health, uh, psychological, bodily health, as well as, uh, you might say, um, uh, Republicans would say non-dominating social relations, I would say independence respecting social relations within the economy. Um, and I think this goes much beyond the normal conception of health to include um, ways in which institutions support uh, equality in social relations of all kinds. Uh, and there I think basic income is uh, necessary but not sufficient, but a very exciting, um, presents a very exciting vision for uh, or rethinking uh, how institutions govern our lives and because they do, how we need to shape them. Um, so this also allows me to explore how basic income is not in conflict with other instruments of humanist governance that I identify. Um, and of course I, I talk about public services and, and how they might be delivered and funded and, and I'm very keen on not losing, uh, but in fact reinventing the concept of planning uh, and occupational planning. Uh, in, especially within public service provision and I'm also very keen to explore why stable work matters and why I, in terms of humanist justice and governance, I am very sceptical of the vision that basic income might help support self-governance of work. Um, fourth argument I make uh, is in terms of what I call human, human interests. I argue that um, above the political uh, or maybe even before the political uh, it's possible to identify human interests in this thing that I explore as humanist governance and uh, in my book and I talk about the presence, the existence of a human economy which actually governs uh, governance, so to speak. It, it, so, that, so the challenge really for, um, for us is to make institutions, uh, design institutions in a way that they are more responsive to this, uh, what I refer to as a human economy. Uh, and I, I can't really go into that in great length in this talk, but I invite you to read the book because I say more about it there. And the last point uh, I think is relevant just uh, to mention this context is how then I engage the human development approach, um, um, in particular the work of Sen, um, as well as to some extent Nussbaum. But um, Sen is well known um, to be a, a skeptic of universal basic income. And I think one of the reasons uh, he's a skeptic is because of the strict egalitarian design of a universal basic income. And he worries, of course, uh, that this will undermine uh, the rationale when thinking about capabilities and supporting capabilities for distributing resources unequally and also to focus on public provision in relation to need. And so one of the arguments I make uh, is that if we approach the problem of of basic income, the case for basic income from the perspective of humanist justice, or humanist governance, actually many of the objections that Sen might have uh, about basic income, they fall away. Um, and also uh, many of the, um, the, the sort of confidence that Sen might have had about um, public provision uh, supporting capabilities, of course, we know are now under challenge. We have the rise of punitive states and sanctioned systems that stigmatize and set uh, uh, um, many groups in society outside, as it were, of the models of incorporation that exist in the contemporary welfare state. Um, and so um, I think when people from the uh, human development perspective argue, and there's a very famous um, 
uh, image um, in which the argument is presented against something like a universal basic income, which is the image of the family who's uh, standing, on bo standing on boxes to try and view a football match um, that is occurring behind a fence. And um, they all get the same box, um, but what's the outcome of this? The outcome of this is that only the father is able to lift his head uh, above the fence and watch a football match. A, uh, his wife's too short and his, his children are too short. Then there's a similar image where you have uh, a disabled person in a wheelchair equally unable to lift his head above the parapet and watch the football match. Um, and so this is the argument against uh, strict egalitarian justice. Uh, that's made and in favour of um, a capabilities approach. Now I argue that whilst I accept that and I actually agree with the problem that is portrayed there, what this image does is it takes these boxes, the existence of these staple boxes that lift people above uh, the parapet for granted and what we have now is that we have a broken, uh, a broken uh, system, uh, the foundation for the, of, of the building is broken and, and a bit uh, perhaps it was always broken. I mean, one of the arguments I make in the book also is that um, I, I, I reject the idea that basic income should replace the postal welfare state in uh, wholesale, but I do argue that the postal welfare state was built on a design flaw, a massive design flaw, which um, continued to reinvent itself in different forms, which is, of course, the means test and the conditionality test on uh, basic subsistence. Um, but, but it's possible to correct this design flaw without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, and, and so, again, um, I think I need to conclude. I've spoken for nearly 11 minutes. Um, I just, uh, the, the case I make in the book really is that it's possible to make the case for basic income from a human development perspective. Uh, I criticise some aspects of the human development perspective, particularly its uh, scepticism uh, concerning governance and institutions. Um, um, and, and I advance. Uh, a uh, case for basic income in terms of humanist justice, but I also advance a broader case for humanist justice in that book. Um, that's my talk, and I hope it all goes well, and thank you very much for listening to me. Bye-bye. Thank you to Louise there, setting out a democratic humanist perspective, uh, focusing on human development, in particular benefits of basic income for health and uh, participation in democratic governance. Uh, so our next perspective is going to come from Robert Van Der Veen, who I think is going to talk about a Marxist perspective on basic income. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here at the conference in India to present a perspective, a secular perspective on basic income that is based on Marx. It's not Marxist in the sense of being wedded to a class struggle movement, uh, to the anticipation of a transition to a socialist system of production. It is rather a system um, that I have in mind that is based on a Marxian vision of communism. And communism is a system, an association, as Marx would say, in which the ruling principle is the full and free development of every individual. Now, I could call this talk the pivotal role of unconditional basic income in the transition to this kind of communism based on the ruling principle of the free, full and free development of every individual as Marx set it out in the third volume of Capital and other places even foreshadowed as early as 1848 in the Communist Manifesto, where he talks about communism as an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. So, just a remark. To achieve this transition and have UBI, unconditional basic income, in the usual sense in which we are discussing it here, is an individual, non-means-tested, and not tied up with behavioral obligations. Those three features of in unconditionality play, play a role in this story. And to, to have this perspective here maybe is 
rather appropriate from the point of view of the title of this Bien Congress, which is basic income as freedom and development. So now, how is the communist goal to be achieved? How does the transition work? And what is the function of basic income in it? Now, here I built on work which I did long ago in independently and then uh, in close harmony with Philippe van Parijs in this article, uh, The Capitalist Road to Communism, in which we have a, a kind of notional starting point where it is economically feasible to distribute basic income unconditionally for every resident at the level of customary subsistence. This is perhaps a little bit optimistic, but it is our vantage point, and it defines the starting point of this perspective. And now, in order to explain how this basic income can transform society in a way that will bring progressively forward this ideal of the free development, the full of free development of every individual, I invoke a Marxian article of faith. The article of faith is called the primacy of the productive forces. And it is the proposition that in the right social relations, which could be in our story, a capitalist welfare state, in the right institutional structure, the forces of production, growth and technology will develop progressively to create both more free time and more consumption possibilities. Moreover, in the long term, this is a process in which through consumption, and enjoyment of free time in the collectivity, in the family, and in the whole state, the needs of the people develop progressively in a more all-round form, in a more sophisticated way, in a way that Marx calls the development of the species being. Now, here you, have a, here you have a real article of faith which Marx developed throughout his whole work, starting from the Economic and Philosophy manuscripts in 1843. So this is what we actually do invoke. Now to the pivotal role of basic income. Here the story becomes a little bit more economic. It is important to note that uh, the, this, this process of development of the productive forces under modern conditions almost everywhere and for a long time, not only in the era of robotization, automation, AI, uh, development of biological technology, no, for quite a long time, indeed, since the early industrial revolution, we have a development where uh, the demand for labor is progressively declining, even though consumption through economic growth grows constantly. If you look at series, time series, you can, you can see this over the long, long run. And this means that basic income can be used to adjust the supply of labor, given growing populations and education, which puts people on the labor market as suppliers of labor. The basic income as an unconditional income, which is apart from the wage, can be used to progressively dampen down the supply of labor to adjust to a gradually declining volume of labor demand. And in doing so, this would not only benefit the people who actually get the basic income, but it would also prevent the labor market in the capitalist economy from generating unemployment progressively, it would lead to 
a situation where un voluntary unemployment replaces involuntary unemployment through the rise of the basic income. So that's one reason why we think basic income is a pivotal institution in a capitalist welfare state under these technological conditions. But there is another aspect to this which might be called the shift from contributions to needs. So the wage and other conditional mechanisms for getting production underway and achieving economic growth uh, falls under the principle broadly of contribution, whereas in this proposal about the transition to communism, the sphere of need is taken care, not completely, because there is still education and there is still health care and there are still uh, facilities for housing and infrastructure, obviously, but a lot of the need is taken care of by this institution of basic income, which is becoming, as I just explained, progressively more important in this perspective, in this sketch of the transition. And so what you have is a shift from contribution to needs as basic income grows as a proportion of national output per capita. And why this is interesting is because basic income is starting at a level, in our story at least, eh, is starting in a level where it is dispensed at the level of subsistence, but now because it grows faster than output, it is progressively eating up, as it were, income per capita. And this leads to a notional endpoint in which almost the whole social product per capita will be distributed in the form of a basic income. Now, so far the transition, but now the main Marxian justification for this is in terms of three desiderata which are tied to the traditional analysis of Marx about the three evils of capitalism. Remember, we're still talking about a capitalist society, even though it has a welfare state, which is able to administer the policies that lead ultimately to a progressively rising basic income. So what, from that point of view, what about the three evils of capitalism? They, those are, as is well known, first, exclusion. Exclusion of labor from the labor process. Marx talked about an industrial reserve army of labor waiting to be admitted into the, into the factories, as you know, and in the meantime, almost starving, right? So that was exclusion. Then we have the people actually in the labor process, having to, do, having to do alienated labor, that is labor under the direction of profit-mising capitalists that don't care about the situation of the worker, that don't care about the aspirations of the worker to develop through work, but just has these people working under the threat of exclusion at a minimum subsistence wage, which just is sufficient to reproduce their labor power. And the third evil is that in doing so, people are compelled to perform surplus labor, extra products for the capitalists. Now, basic income, especially a basic income which, which is completely unconditional, in the three senses outlined would diminish exclusion because it would be an instrument of adjusting the labor market from supply to demand. Secondly, it would give the workers freedom from toil. They would not have to work if they didn't want any more unless they wanted to take care of their interests over and above subsistence, which gives them, obviously, 
the bargaining power, and the famous, the famous ability to say no to bad jobs and to say yes to good jobs, even if those good jobs are not very lucrative in terms of wages. And this contributes to the dimin diminution of alienated labor. Finally, exploitation would also be on the way out in this version of the capitalist welfare state with basic income as his pivotal institution of social welfare because, as Marx defines it, capital, um, exploitation, capitalist exploitation, is compelling the worker under threat of exclusion, under threat of starvation, uh, to perform surplus labor. Obviously, when there is freedom from toil, from the outset guaranteed by basic income at subsistence level, then there can be no compulsion. And surplus labor is handed over in the labor process under different conditions voluntarily by the workers, which is a much better situation that does not justify the label of exploitation with its negative connotations of unfair appropriation any longer. So far, I think this is, this is what the perspective says. And I want, to, I want to just end by saying that in this story, there are many, many elements of a common ground about how basic income is supposed to work. I think if you connect my story some of the elements of my story and some of the elements of the story presented by Malcolm in this session, they are pretty much the same. Especially if you talk about the advantages of basic income over means-tested uh, distribution of social welfare. Um, the principle the principal advantage of having these different perspectives, I think, is not only that they cater to people that already believe in the articles of faith of the perspective in question, but that it also, through focusing on a common ground of understanding about how basic income can improve matters, which is more or less independent of perspectives, it contributes to the higher levels of understanding and diversity in a open society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the remainder of the session, uh, I want to, uh, first of all, use my position as chair just to dig into uh, some of the issues about religion, uh, religious and secular perspectives a bit more. I'll uh, uh, pose a couple of questions, uh, one to Malcolm, one to Hassanane. Um, I'm then going to ask uh, Professor Mustafa, Vice Principal of uh, the university we're at, uh, I'll ask him after I've uh, ask those questions to, to say a few words, and then I'll open it up to the floor. I think we have about uh, half an hour remaining in, in total. Um, so first of all then, um, just thinking about the uh, benefits or risks of basic income advocates engaging more with uh, faith-based arguments and communities. Um, so on the one hand, thinking about the reservations or, or anxieties that some people are going to have about that. There's, there's um, an argument that comes from a very influential uh, school of political philosophy in Anglo-American academic political philosophy, which says, well, you know, religious arguments are okay for believers, but they're not the sort of arguments that you should make in a public context to your fellow citizens. Um, so, for example, an argument that appeals to the example of Jesus Christ, the way Christ lived, uh, which argues that uh, we should uh, follow that, that might be an argument that's okay 
as it were, as a private argument for Christians. It might be a very authoritative argument for how they should live their lives. But a, a, a certain kind of critic is going to say it, it's not an argument for using the state as a coercive institution to set up a basic income program. Um, it's not an argument that's going to have resonance for the non-Christian, precisely because it, it appeals so much to Christian beliefs. So I wondered if Malcolm, uh, in a moment, could say something about that sort of sceptical argument, which I, which I know is out there. Um, then, thinking on, on the more positive side, we do have an example in the US and the UK, certainly, of... Um, very successful community organising, broad-based community organising on the model of Citizens UK, for example, which, for example, has put the living wage as a policy very much on the agenda in, in the UK. Um, so I'm just wondering what uh, the basic income movement, what basic an income campaigners might have to learn from broad-based community organising? Is there potential for a kind of uh, uh, constructive link up there? And I was wondering um, if Hassanane could say more about that. So first, Malcolm, if you could uh, respond to the, the sort of sceptical challenge, and then Hassanane, if you could say more about uh, the community organising side. It's generally true that any argument for basic income will appeal to some people and not to others. And to each individual or institution, one set of arguments might appeal and another might not. Um, so yes, it is important uh, to, uh, to bring arguments from a Christian perspective into the public sphere, uh, because there will be institutions and individuals to whom those arguments will appear to be relevant. There are other reasons as well. Um, the, it, for a coherent society, it's important that we should understand each other. And so for somebody for whom a basic income argument for within the Christian uh, tradition uh, may not seem immediately obvious, to hold that dialogue can enable the individual or institution concerned to understand more about the society, the very diverse society in which we live. And it's good for all of us to hear arguments from new perspectives that will enhance our own understanding both of the world in which we live and of the basic income and the debate about it that's, that's now highly diverse and global. An important element of the diversity that faith communities and faith tradition arguments bring into the basic income debate is the very diversity of those faith communities and traditions. I have offered you a particular Christian perspective. There are many others. And there are arguments within the Christian tradition against a basic income. It's important to recognize that. In Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, he famously said, the one who, uh, who does not work shall not eat. Now, that was a, 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 an expression of frustration uh, expressed towards some individuals in the church who weren't pulling their weight and providing enough resources so that the church could serve those in need. Um, that's the context. But that is still wheeled out sometimes as a general statement. It's important to hear those things and to know that some Christians come from that point of view. So the diversity of our society, the diversity of different faith communities and traditions, we all need them all. And so it is important that those faith community debates, that perspectives get into the public sphere. Just to add to that, I, I agree with what Malcolm said, but there is an example. We have an example of institutions that try and target multiple or a very diverse society using multiple messages for different target audiences. And the example is business. And we see it all the time in business. In reality, what we're talking about here and having different messages for different audiences, this is a marketing issue. Um, and it comes up again and again. When Asda in Kings Heath in Birmingham has a massive Eid Mubarak 
stool, and Asda in Sutton Coalfield will have a small A4 poster saying Happy Eid. You know, they, they've understood the power of mixing those messages. It is an unfortunate reality that there is a discomfort. You know, if we started having an Allahu Akbar basic income is great campaign, that's not going to fly well with every section of society, especially in, you know, uh, in Western countries and given the political climates we live in today. But um, I think the solution is, as you say, to have different messages for different audiences, and we have examples of how that can work really great. And it links really well to the question you asked of me about uh, broad-based community organizing. Uh, I want to make a plug, because Michael is here. Um, he's got a session on tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow on community organizing um, in this space, so uh, definitely look out for that, because he'll be able to give you a lot more insight and depth than I can. Um, what I can say is community organizing has worked very well in the UK for other campaigns such as the living wage um, and broad-based community organizing. So if I, if I give you the example of Citizens UK, it's about bringing together different sections of society. So Citizens UK is essentially a union for institutions. So they bring together trade unions, um, community, uh, sorry, so faith groups, schools, universities, um, and we and leaders from all these institutions discuss different issues that are pertinent to them and then take it forward and build political power. But it's, a, it's quite a mouthful to explain, but actually it's been very, very successful in the UK and uh, it has gained a lot of power over the years. Um, but what's been really powerful about community organizing, specifically in the UK, is that it's come about by building power through relationships. So when, when I started community organizing, what was drilled into me was it's all about relationships. So it's about sitting down and having one-to-one -one conversations with people. Even Citizens UK, when they had their big assemblies and they meet uh, politicians, what they what they, what they do is they testify, and they have testimony, like we heard this morning, um, which can be a really powerful, emotional uh, way of bringing across the campaign. And this is the important thing about broad-based community organizing, is that it has to, by its very nature, be broad, and hence has to find the sweet spot. It has to find what appeals to the faith communities, what will appeal to the trade unions, what will appeal to the workforce, what will appeal to the politicians. And so in doing that, they have to refine their message to something that works uh, in a very emotional way. And this is the only, the only way that this discussion will move out of the academic space and more into the activist space is when the message changes from a rational, you know, this, these are really important discussions, the, the academic discussions are really important to create the groundwork, but from an activist perspective, it has to move from a rational to an emotional place where we are appealing to people and what's important to people and trying to make basic income a part of that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Professor Mustafa for some comments. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Good morning. So I don't know this subject. Now, since the conference is being held at Nalsar, uh, there should be some opportunity for me to welcome each one of you. I don't know this subject because my colleague, Professor Dhanda, who teaches law and poverty, has declared me persona non grata for her classes. So I don't have advantage of her scholarship uh, in knowing this subject. Moreover, I came here at 8.50 in the morning, because that was the original time given. But we started late, so I did not have the advantage of even listening to other speakers. So uh, I'm not really the right person to say anything on what they have spoken. Theology is also not my subject. So I can't say much about Islam or Judaism or Christianity or other religions. But this topic as such reminds me of a Urdu couplet which I will translate in a minute. Ghar ja ke bahut roe, maa baap akele mein. Ghar ja ke bahut roe, maa baap akele mein. Mitti ke khilone bhi, 
सस्ते न थे मेले में पेरेंट्स वेन दे रिटर्न होम फ्रॉम एन एग्जिबिशन दे क्राइड अ लॉट बिकॉज इवन क्ले टॉयज टॉयज मेड ऑफ क्ले वर नॉट विद इन देयर मीन्स एंड दे कूडेंट बाई देम फॉर देयर चिल्ड्रेन अबाउट इस्लाम एज आई सेड आई एम नॉट अ थियोलॉजियन बट वन इस्लाम इज ऑल अबाउट इक्वेलिटी नंबर ऑफ प्लेसेस कुरान विल से दैट गॉड इज बेसिकली विद द पुअर Prophet himself was extremely poor, orphan and poor. Even other prophets, as you know, that Islam was not a new religion. Uh, it validates the earlier prophets. So Jesus was equally poor. Uh, Moses was also not very rich. Of course, Solomon was rich, and so was uh, 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 David. So Islam is all about poor, downtrodden. uh underprivileged but the difference between marx and islam is that of course marx himself you know would look at a state as a new will and as the greatest instrument of exploitation so i really don't know how that state uh would really do something uh, good because of which uh, hegel would call it a march of the god on earth but islam rather than a state would look at fellow human beings uh to take care of uh, other human beings with one minor difference if it is an islamic state and there are non minorities then the responsibility of the protection of non minorities is with the state and this protection is not just the physical protection it has to be in uh, uh, all other uh, matters as well now the whole idea of uh, zakat comes from the islamic uh, view in quran that there is a share of others in your wealth so you may make wealth as much as you want but there is a share for those who don't have wealth so there is a very minimum which islam has fixed but it encourages people not to have concentration of wealth it favors circulation of wealth it doesn't like people who keep too much of wealth with them and that's why they are other than zakat they have to do sadqa and several other things islam also opposes interest of course this interest is not modern interest it's usury and the whole idea is that uh, when an individual is taking loan from another individual the rate of interest should not be exploitative uh, and uh, very uh, high rates now as soon as prophet died the way the human beings are muslims refused to pay zakat and therefore first major jihad the holy war with the first islamic state had to fight was against muslims who said we will not pay this mandatory uh, zakat which is a, a share of the poor in the wealth of uh, uh, rich the other thing i want to say is uh, if you look at the uh, whole scheme of islamic society it says that you are not supposed to have your food even food if your neighbor is uh, going to sleep hungry and in defining neighbor it says 40 houses on your left and 40 houses on your right and 40 houses on your front and 40 houses on your back so everybody has this responsibility that if you are taking food there has to be a share for others uh, in your neighborhood and rights of neighbors were so much emphasized by prophet muhammad that there was a fear that maybe a share in inheritance will be created for uh, for the neighbors even though this uh, subsequently did not happen now let me quickly come to my little bit understanding of uh, indian constitution which is the subject i teach uh, we talk of uh, justice social economic and political uh, we talk of equality of status and opportunities uh, we want to reduce inequalities but what is the reality the reality is 1% people in india have 77% of wealth and the difference between rich and poor with every passing day is increasing 
the number of billionaires in India is increasing every year, and these billionaires are doubling and tripling their wealth every year. Now, if this is the situation, is universal basic income a solution? This whole idea at a time when we are talking of uniformity, that there should be one law and one religion and one language, can there be something very basic for everybody? So those who are all for uniformity at least should support it. The, I, this is the idea whose time, in my opinion, has come. It's a worthwhile idea. And this idea is good because it ensures freedom of choice. You don't tell him the money you give me, how I will use it. I think that is central to it. And this idea is good because it is based on the equality. Everyone will get it. Even rich will get it. So the government will not tell it, we are giving you this money, use it for fertilizers. We are giving you this money, use it for the school education. We are giving you this money, uh, uh, use it for X, Y, Z thing. Now, in another one minute, I would say, the idea is great. But in law, the training is, we should always play the devil's advocate. And therefore, if we want this idea to be implemented, of course, Indian people have not shown uh, great interest. So the Sikkim chief minister, former chief minister, uh, in 2019 elections promised universal basic income. He was in power for some 35 years. He lost the election. Congress made some kind of similar promise. Nobody looked at it. So we need to convince majority that there is some value and some worth in this proposal. And it is based on the liberty model. Then only we can really move forward. And why should we move forward? Because, first of all, we should tell these people who oppose it that the whole scheme of trickle-down effect of uh, globalized, liberalized economy has not really helped the poor. As I told you, that rich is getting richer. Markets have been ruthless. They have not been fair. And therefore, we have to do something. Now, my only problem is, that these critics feel if there is a universal basic income, then people will become lazy, they will not work, and therefore we must straight away question and demolish this argument. I think the greatest disservice which Hobbes has done to legal theory is this, that he distrusted all of us. He said men are nasty and brutish and this and selfish. And since men are so bad, we need a state to discipline them. And therefore, we have conceded so much of power to the state. Now a state, going by this Hobbesian view, feels that if it gives money, we will not work, we will not do vaccination, uh, we will not take care of iodine deficiency, and therefore they will tell, do this, do that, do that. I think we have to convince the state that it can have some trust uh, in the wisdom of human beings. The other thing I want to say is that we need to tell our people that we may be soon you know, on the path of becoming a five trillion economy, but on global hunger index, we stand at 103 out of 119. If this is our new India, it's not the India one would like to live. On human development index, we are 130 out of 189. On health services, we are 145 out of 195. And therefore, we need to initiate this debate. Of course, Prime Minister himself is uh, quite interested. Our uh, uh, economic survey in 2017 talked about it. A number of other countries are having a serious conversation in Canada, Netherlands, Italy, Scotland, Finland. So I think India, too, should uh, uh, start this conversation. But we just I'm taking last minute. What we need to do? We have to tell these people that, one, this is a very, very small amount. Therefore, let us not say that if this happens, uh, then uh, something very great is going to happen in our society. So even in the pilot we did in Madhya Pradesh, what was the amount we were giving? Some 300 rupees. So 300 rupees 
uh, or where you give, even if it becomes 670, 22 rupees a day is a very, very small amount. Two, we have to convince that currently we are spending about 4.9% uh, on various uh, subsidies, about 950 schemes right now government is uh, undertaking. So all these schemes will come to an end, and if we add another 3% uh, to it, uh, we would be able to really uh, implement it. So how do we get the public support? They say it is maybe good uh, uh, politics, but it is bad economics. They say that politicians would indulge in uh, competitive populism, so if one party promises 1,000 rupees, the other party will promise 2,000 rupees, the third party will promise uh, 3,000 rupees. Therefore, we have to answer this question. And then we have to answer the question that will people really be willing to do employments? Now, our Prime Minister, in our Independence Day uh, speech, he said we live in an aspirational India. So if you give people schools, they will say, no, give us university. If you give people roads, they will ask for the airport. And if you give them electricity, they will say, give us 24-hour electricity. If we really believe that we live in an aspirational India, people will not stop working with this 300 rupees or 600 rupees, whatever. Those aspirations will still survive. Three, I, and I end here, we need to seriously debate what will be the impact on the taxation? If this scheme is going to lead to very high tax rates, middle classes are going to oppose it. And therefore, we have to do something that even with those high taxes, uh, uh, their earnings are not going to be uh, really adversely affected. Uh, with these few words, uh, I would end. But personally, uh, I feel that this is an exciting idea. This is the minimum uh, we should do uh, for our fellow human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mustafa. Um, Sarat has reminded me that uh, Roberto Merrill is also down as a discussant for the panel, but I'm, I do want to, as we're almost up against time, I'm going to take some questions from, uh, from the floor, and then uh, I know Roberto's speaking in some other panels later, so if he wants to contribute on this, maybe uh, he can do that then. So, any questions? Thank you very much. My name is Professor Israel Kodiaga from Kenya. I must say this is a wonderful discussion. This is a session that has uplifted my spirit in very many ways. However, I have a comment and some reaction. Particularly, uh, I'm persuaded by the Marxist school. I'm also persuaded by uh, Widow Quist. However, Two comments about the religious perspectives, which I feel if we adopt as a way of talking about UBI, would be losing the focus, is this appeal to an attempt to try to find a religious explanation or justification for UBI. A case in point is uh, the speaker who talked about the Kantian ethics, which of course, philosophy philosophy being what it is thrives on controversy. And when you brought in Kantian ethics and you talked about utilitarianism, essentially the same utilitarianism is what the, the Chinese government is using today on account of that which brings the greatest good to the greatest number, thereby ignoring the individual. And where the individual is ignored, then you see Kantian ethics becomes a curse as opposed to a blessing. Two, um, you also, uh, religion has been used to justify oppression, regardless of which religion you are talking about. Whether you are talking about the Abrahamic faiths, Paul advises slaves to be very loyal to their masters. You know that even Jesus, who talked about one person giving a shot to another one, never did much to actually justify the aspect of uh, basic income. Basic income must be pursued as a right as opposed to pursuing it as some favor. Because when we talk about the religious faiths, whether it is Hinduism, 
which you know in this country has stratified the country into caste systems, which again is harmful, and that is the reason for UBI. So the appeal to the religious faiths is to lose focus on UBI. I think we must keep it on the rights aspect, especially when we are talking about freedom. And then there was an allusion to St. Augustine. And St. Augustine, with his paradise lost and paradise gained, ostensibly now makes us contribute to the UBI from a faith point of view that somehow will benefit later. We want UBI to be seen as a right so that governments and those in charge, even the people in, form, in charge of industry, see the need to give it because either if they fail to give it, then they are actually trampling on people's rights as opposed to trying to use metaphysical models to justify a rights issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if you're interested in raising, uh, putting a question, could you raise your hand? Good morning, everyone. Uh, wonderful presentations. My name is Min. I'm from Moroville. My question is essentially, can we have perspectives from the Hindu and Buddhist faiths also, which is missing? Uh, so if anyone here can say a little bit about that, that would be very helpful to take this conversation further. Thank you. Very interesting conversation. Thanks, guys. As most of you know who've been, uh, who attended the session yesterday, I come from an intergenerational equity perspective, uh, which then comes out into a citizen's dividend. And that actually has slight differences, both on the ethical moral side, as well as religious implications. So just to give an example, you know, we, there was a reference to Amartya Sen uh, not liking uh, universal basic income, and a co-author of his Famous in India, Jean Dries, actually takes a similar position. But Jean Dries is actually a strong supporter of uh, the intergenerational equity route to a citizen's dividend. So there is some sort of a fundamental difference, or you know, maybe a nuanced difference in the two ethical sides, and maybe some conversation on that uh, perspective would be there, uh, would be useful. Maybe Carl is really good at that. I also want to say that uh, when you take an intergenerational equity perspective, there, uh, there has been a lot of mapping of uh, the religious uh, underpinnings of that perspective across religions, including Buddhism and Hinduism. And uh, it links also to the environment movement and climate change. And there have been interfaith dialogue, interfaith resolution around climate change. And if you see the issue in totality, uh, then it actually links up quite a lot. And to be specific, if you look at Pope Francis, we haven't had a Catholic point of view here, but Pope Francis's uh, Laudato Si, his environmental encyclical, made a very important theological point that dominion, he redefined the perspective of what dominion over the fish and the fowl means. And he brought it into a stewardship context and not a, we can do what we want uh, over the planet. And uh, we can, I've actually taken Laudato C and taken extracts and made it, and uh, it comes out basically to the argument we're making. And we've used it, and the Archbishop of Goa actually has publicly supported uh, our perspective from an ethical ground. So uh, just, you know, in, the, in terms of, any perspectives on how the citizens' dividend route is different from sort of a minimum income route would be interesting. I'm going to ask each of our panelists, as we're right up against time, to respond to one of the, of the questions of their own choice. And I'm going to start at uh, uh, Robert's end of the table and just work across. So one quick uh, comment in response to one of, of those questions from each panelist. Yeah, okay. Um, do you hear me? Okay. So I want to comment on the last, uh, on the last speaker. Um, I think it's very, a very interesting idea to have a perspective on basic income from the point of view of common inheritance, the commons we all own in some respect. And in your uh, positioning of this issue, uh, which I think is 
extremely coherent and very appealing, there is a decision made to focus on constitutional rights, a separation between property uh, managed by firms in need of regulation, both for inheritance of our commons to the next generation, so the, the bequest problem, and also funding the present generation and their UBI comes in as a almost natural property right. I think, I think this is a very powerful uh, connection uh, between the idea of a common inheritance, which is an idea that appeals to many, many perspectives. Let me just illustrate how that perspective can also be, that idea of the commons can also be uh, seen from the point of view of Marxism. This would be an interpretation of the commons where you say it's not only a question of natural resources, it's a question of collectively built up labor power, knowledge, organizational acuity in the whole society that makes this productivity going that we have as the development of the productive forces. And by virtue of that, we can apply the commons idea as well and use it, for instance, to tax for the government, to create sovereign wealth funds. So in all that, there is a basis for dispensing an equal amount on the basis of unconditionality, surely. But it's not the case that this is an automatic conclusion. There are other possibilities, and I think in the whole discussion about UBI and the commons, this must be faced. Okay, I want to draw a connection between uh, what uh, Israel said and something that Stuart said earlier, is that uh, should we not stay away from these religious perspectives? Why use the coercive uh, apparatus of the state to enforce a basic income on the basis of religious beliefs. And I think it's this belief that, that we should constrain, I'm not a religious person, but I believe that we cannot ask religious people to totally stay away from these ideas. If you, many religious people believe that religion is the source of morality, and they cannot honestly speak about what they think is moral about without connecting it to their religious beliefs. And it must be a part of the public sphere, and we, can, we simply need to understand how is this relevant. This thing comes from their religious perspective. How is it, to me, from my religious or secular perspective needs to be made? And when that comes to issues like these so-called lazy workers, this needs to come, a lazy worker is somebody who won't work for the wage you're paying. Why do we always say it's a lazy worker and we never say it's a cheap employer? If this person doesn't want your wage, maybe you're too cheap to pay the wage they deserve. And because we have closed the comment, we have owed this to us because we do not let people work for themselves. And work today means working for the more privileged. We owe us. We owe it to each other for closing the commons a basic income large enough to meet your basic needs so that you decide if you're going to work for someone else or not. Thank you. No, just taking it forward from uh, him, I feel if you look at uh, the money which religions raise out of charities, uh, if you go to churches or mosques or temples, they have huge money. Now, in this donation, there is an element of voluntariness. People on their own come forward and make such big donations. In our taxation scheme, there is an element of coercion. So I feel that it will help us if we involve religions and faith communities and faith organizations in this conversation. Because they can be easily convinced, as you rightly said, about the whole morality of the scheme. And since in democracy, ultimately, the numbers will matter, we thought that religion will wither away, and we thought in 19th century that there was some death of God, but religion has come back in a big way. 
So we cannot completely exclude religion from our conversation. In fact, including them can help us in creating the popular opinion. As I said in democracies, unless we convince the majority, the governments will not really be on board. Thank you. So I plan to address the same question uh, from the professor from Kenya who talked so eloquently about the curse of Kantian ethics. I think it, it's been answered, but I think the key thing is if we're going to be campaigning on basic income, this isn't about religious justification and it's not about making religion the source of anything good. It's about identity. It's about the fact that the people we're trying to talk to, the people who need to be convinced of this, globally or uh, even in my context in the UK, have uh, an affinity and an affiliation with their religion. And sometimes it's their primary identity. It's what they identify with more than their Britishness or their gender or their working class, uh, you know, or their, or their class structure. So if religion is their primary identity, then there needs to be some connection to that, to, to that part of their identity to get them on board with it. The, um, it doesn't always follow that pattern though. And I think what's really interesting uh, is in America, um, gay marriage and the support for gay marriage in the Muslim community especially is a really interesting study because uh, a few years ago, a study showed that 54% of Muslims in America support gay marriage despite there being absolutely no religious justification presented from religious leaders uh, around that. There are some small reformist communities in America, but in general there isn't. So, so maybe there's something to explore that doesn't always follow that, and I think it's changing as well, especially in Western countries as we get into third, fourth generation uh, immigration in the Muslim community and even further on for other communities, then there, there, are, there is change happening. But today, in the sphere we're in, religious justification or, or, cam or in a campaign making sure that there's connection to religious ideas that people identify with is still, is still vital, it's still really important. Thank you. Um, most of what I would have said has been said, which is great. Um, I'd like to respond to one or two sentences in the first comment. Um, uh, as the early Christians reflected on the life of Jesus, they grasped something that they were simply not able to put into effect in the society of their own day. So, for instance, um, they grasped the fact that slaves and masters were equal in the sight of God, and that's what they gave effect to within the Christian community of the church. And so they found that uh, they had then had a real problem because within society around the church, slaves were beginning to disobey their masters because within the context of the church, they were equal. Um, hence, Paul's suggestion to the slaves that, that for their own good and the good of the church in their secular life, they really did have to carry on obeying their masters. It just wasn't in Paul's gift to abolish slavery. We know what he felt about it because when he wrote a letter to Philemon, he asked Philemon to release his slave, whom Paul had got to know. And it was later in the history of the Christian church that what these early Christians had grasped, they were able to give effect to and were at the heart of the abolition of slavery. Paul had grasped the, the, the absolute equality of everybody when he wrote his letter to the Galatians. He said there was neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. Um, and... and, and and, and, and as, 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 as it takes some time sometimes to change society around you uh, to give effect to these fundamental, both religious and human truths. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all of our uh, panelists for their, their contributions. Uh, thank you, the audience. Um, uh, we've run a little over time, but I think it's been a very interesting panel. I think the discussion as a whole has brought out both the, 
the benefits and the challenges of bringing together the secular and the religious perspectives. Uh, I'm not going to try and do a kind of grand summary of it all in my own religious tradition, Quakerism. There's uh, somebody who tries to sum up the, sp the spirit of the meeting. I'm not going to try and do that, but I would pick out three concepts that resonate for me coming out of the discussion, and I'll be thinking more about. One is common ground, the other is mutual learning, and the third uh, has to do with emotion and identity as important uh, features in building a movement alongside uh, rational argument. Uh, so thank you all, uh, and now we'll move to the next stage of the Congress, and let's show our gratitude to the panellists and to yourself for the question.